think we're ready to get going. Thank you all so much for being here, both online and in the room. I'm Sheila Wildman, and I'm the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last in this year's Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. We're meeting in hybrid form today, uh, both online and in person in Mi'kmaq, the ancient and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We pay respect to the indigenous knowledges held by the Mi'kmaq people and the wisdom of their elders, past and present. We also acknowledge the histories, contributions, and legacies of African Nova Scotians who have been in this territory for over 400 years. This year, we convened the seminar series around the theme, Health and Social Justice, Making the Connections. It sounds really simple, uh, but perhaps it's simpler in theory than in practice. Today's lecture brings our series to a fitting conclusion and opens the way for a whole new set of conversations. I have the great honor of introducing Dr. Nav Persaud. Persaud? Thank you. Dr. Persaud holds the Canada Research Chair in Health Justice, is a staff physician in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at St. Michael's Hospital in Unity Health Toronto, and is also an Associate Professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Persaud's research focuses on health equity or fairness, especially as it relates to medicine access. In just one expression of that, he's involved in comparing national essential medicines lists in collaboration with the World Health Organization. Dr. Persaud's lecture is entitled, as you see, Access to Essential Medicines, More Than Just a Human Right. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Persaud. Thanks very much for that really kind and generous introduction. It's really great to be here with all of you, and I appreciate the invitation. Okay, um, just a standard disclosure slide. Uh, don't have any funding from the pharmaceutical industry, and it might be clear why as the talk goes on. Although I have received some interesting uh, offers actually that uh, we could chat about if you're interested. Grateful uh, for uh, support for my research from a number of uh, public sources and from the University of Toronto and St. Michael's Hospital uh, in Toronto. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, be able to present some of the work my colleagues and I have done uh, on a clinical trial, some international comparisons of essential medicines, access, uh, and then finally um, talking about human rights here in Canada as it pertains to uh, medication access. Canada is the only high income country in the world where healthcare services are publicly funded, but access to medications uh, generally are not. And instead, uh, access to medicines tends to rely on employment or um, on social assistance. People on welfare or disability often receive publicly funded access to medicines, but there would be many people um, who don't. And nationally representative surveys indicate that millions of people don't have any type of insurance and cannot afford medications. Uh, those would include um, life-saving medications like insulin for people with type 1 diabetes. It was discovered more than 100 years ago, and their rights for insulin were sold for a dollar each to the co-discoverers in the interest of having access to insulin for everyone who needed it. And yet there are people uh, today, um, my patients, who can't afford uh, insulin. And this issue of cost-related non-adherence, not being able to take medications as instructed specifically because of the cost, uh, does not apply equally. It's a highly gendered and racialized uh, issue because it's tied to employment. Um, so several studies looking at cost-related non-adherence have found that Indigenous people and other racialized people are more likely to report cost-related non-adherence compared with white people. So that's not being able to afford medications because of the cost. 
Um, and so I'm about to, to um, present some of the results of a clinical trial that my colleagues and I from across Canada uh, conducted addressing this issue. Um, there are a number of sites involved. Uh, most of the patients were from uh, family medicine sites and primary care sites associated with St. Michael's Hospital. And there were uh, three other sites, um, uh, three rural sites in Ontario, close to uh, Manitoulin Island. So we randomized uh, 786 people who reported that they couldn't afford uh, medications. And these would include um, people who worked in jobs where they didn't have uh, private insurance. So uh, there were some uh, artists in the study. Uh, there were people who worked in factories. Uh, there were taxi drivers. Uh, and these people wouldn't have access to private insurance. And they often would have a low or uncertain income and therefore not be able to afford medicines. And anyone who reported cost-related non-adherence in the last 12 months um, was eligible to participate. And then half the participants roughly were uh, randomly allocated to receive free access to a carefully selected set of medicines. And the other half um, continued with their usual poor access to medicines. And uh, there are around 140 medicines that people uh, could have access to, and they, these were based on the World Health Organization's model list of essential medicines. Uh, in general, um, people got their medications from a remote pharmacist. We set up a pharmacy specifically for the purposes of this study. Uh, the pharmacist had access to the electronic medical record and received medication orders um, online, and then communicate with the patient over the phone usually. Uh, and then mail or courier uh, the medications to the patient, depending on the need. For a small number of medications like antibiotics, they were available in the clinic and dispensed to uh, patients at the point of care so that they could um, uh, go home with the medication and not have to wait for delivery. But the vast majority of medications um, were delivered. And what we found was that there was a, an improvement in a primary outcome of this study, which was uh, adherence to medicines that were appropriately prescribed. We also registered um, some improvements in certain surrogate health outcomes, like control of uh, diabetes, as measured through the hemoglobin A1C, uh, and control of the systolic uh, blood pressure. Uh, there was no change that we registered in terms of the uh, LDL or low density lipoprotein measure of cholesterol. Um, the biggest improvement that we noticed, though, was in the ability to make ends meet or uh, afford basic necessities like rent uh, and food without incurring debt. Uh, so there, there was an absolute increase in uh, of almost 60%. So it was around 20% of people in the usual access group reported the ability to make ends meet, but around 80% of those who got free access to medicines reported the ability to make ends meet or afford basic necessities. And this finding was remarkable partly because in typical circumstances, providing free access to these medicines would only decrease costs by around 30 or $50 per month. Uh, but even that relatively modest savings could be the difference between being able to uh, pay the rent uh, or not. Uh, we also tracked uh, using uh, health administrative data total health care costs. And we found that um, the annual uh, total health care costs were around $1,000 lower than those who got free access to medicines. And the largest cost uh, was related to hospitalization. So there were some patients in the control arm, the usual access arm of the trial, who were, for example, being repeatedly admitted to the hospital uh, because they did not have access to insulin and they would, um, be admitted to the hospital, uh, including sometimes to the ICU, uh, provided with insulin, given a box of insulin to go home with. Uh, and then when that box ran out, they would come uh, back to the hospital and uh, in many cases back to the um, intensive care unit. Um, there were some additional benefits that we found through some qualitative work of participants, both in the uh, free access group and the usual access group. Uh, one interesting and somewhat unexpected uh, benefit was an improvement in the relationship between patients and their provider. 
and uh, better adherence actually to attending appointments and having blood work done. For example, um, we heard from some patients with diabetes that when they weren't taking the medications, they didn't see a point in going to the lab and checking their blood work because they knew it was just going to show that their uh, blood sugar level was high because uh, they weren't taking the treatment. But when they were taking the treatment, uh, there was a purpose uh, to doing the blood work and that helped to improve the relationship and also increase the likelihood that they would attend appointments with their primary care provider, also with some other uh, consultants. Um, uh, some short films were made about the experiences of people uh, in the study. And one example was an individual on Manitoulin Island who talked about how he was better able uh, to work on the land uh, and to produce food um, when he had access to his puffers and how he had to take frequent breaks without the use of his puffer and sometimes not be able to, um, to work at all uh, if his lung condition was acting up. Um, when we presented this study as a proposal to some of the sites, um, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of questions about only providing access to a short list of medicines and uh, you know, not uh, 2,000 medicines that might be on a public formula available to people on social assistance. But by the end of the study, both uh, patients and clinicians found the short list of medicine modeled after the World Health Organization's list uh, to be uh, acceptable with some exceptions. Uh, so typically essential medicines lists only contain um, a few agents from each class. And within the classes of antidepressants and diabetes treatments, uh, some clinicians suggested that there might be um, more options available. Uh, but other than that, um, uh, I think there was a consensus that the list um, met the needs. Um, and I'll just maybe provide some of my own commentary on a short list of uh, medicines that, and uh, provide two examples that actually led me towards this concept of an essential medicines list. One was when I was a student, I attended um, a series of lectures, uh, was it mandatory as part of medical school at the University of Toronto. Um, and then I later found out um, in part through uh, when I was a resident, I, re I reviewed uh, the lecture notes of a then medical student and found a number of inaccuracies um, uh, in the information that was being provided to medical students. And then I subsequently found out that um, the lecture series was supported by Purdue Pharma um, that uh, now is recognized to have contributed to the opioid crisis by mismarketing uh, long-acting opioids like OxyContin and falsely claiming that they had a lower abuse potential uh, than other opioid products. Um, and I had raised uh, some concerns with colleagues about the lectures and it actually took quite a while for things to change. And for some time, uh, this false messaging, uh, these marketing messages kept getting out uh, to medical students. Um, I mean, now it's like not so controversial, I hope to say these things. Uh, there's, there's even like, you could even open up Disney Plus and see Batman as like a doctor prescribing opioids and, uh, and running into trouble. So, uh, so these things hopefully are like a little bit more uh, mainstream now, but at the time um, it occurred to me that there were a lot of openings in the way that medications were selected. Um, and a lot of opportunities for marketing messages to end up shaping prescribing in ways that could be avoided if there was a more um, centralized and independent process for selecting medicines. Uh, you know, another example that led me towards the essential medicines concept uh, was diclectin, uh, doxylamine uh, pyridoxine. It's a commonly used medication to treat nausea and vomiting during pregnancy, commonly referred to as morning sickness. Um, and in the United States, it's uh, sold under the brand name of uh, Diclegis. Um, and some of you might have uh, heard about uh, Kim Kardashian uh, advertising this medication and running into um, uh, some problems with the American regulators about um, some of the, uh, the advertisements. Uh, 
uh, through her social media for this medicine. Um, but uh, the way I came onto it was uh, a patient of mine uh, questioned whether or not um, she should take this medicine. And I reassured her that it was the first line treatment, it was commonly prescribed. Uh, and after she left my clinic, um, I then felt uh, that maybe I had overstated the case. So I went back to the guidelines and I saw um, the first thing that got me interested was instead of citing clinical trials, uh, the clinical practice guideline document that recommended this medication as a first line treatment um, actually cited the product monograph um, from the company that produces this. And this is a, um, you know, like a document that the, the company submits to Health Canada. It's not something that usually clinicians would be uh, relying upon. And um, over many years was able to get uh, information about this medication, including um, uh, some of the original clinical trial reports and indicated that the medication um, is not effective, that the uh, benefits that you see um, in terms of the reduction in nausea and vomiting of pregnancy symptoms over two weeks are almost identical, even as they're reported to those seen with the placebo. And on this scale here, the um, uh, pregnancy unique quantification emesis scale or puke scale, as it's cutely known, uh, three means no symptoms. So it's a bit like the Glasgow coma scale for those of you familiar with it. So there's almost no symptoms in any group. And this is also not even taking into consideration the way they, they handled um, dropouts or those lost to follow up in the study. And if you take those into consideration, there's really uh, no difference at all. And yet this medication uh, continues to be really commonly prescribed. And it's another example of a medication that likely uh, wouldn't be prescribed at all if there was um, uh, better fidelity to a carefully selected set of medicines. And uh, at, this might be a controversial view and one that I'd uh, be interested to discuss afterwards, uh, especially in this setting. Um, but I, um, I grew up in a neighborhood that was, I think, under-resourced and over-policed. And at the same time, I grew up watching Law and Order and really liking it and uh, like enjoyed seeing the good guys, police uh, and prosecutors uh, track down the bad guys. And in most cases, uh, put them behind bars, like all within um, 60 minutes minus commercial breaks. Um, and, but there was a disconnect, I think, between what I was seeing happening in my neighborhood uh, and uh, this idealized version I was seeing on TV. The reason I mention it is because I think earlier in my career, thinking about medications, prescribing and access, earlier I believed that uh, the good guys would uh, appear and save the day, uh, the way that it happened on TV. And through examples like uh, the opioid crisis, uh, this issue with diclectin, which, which has a, like much less of a health implication than the opioid crisis, um, uh, you know, I just came to believe that the good guys were not ever going to show up when it came to um, promoting access to effective medicines and ensuring that people aren't harmed. So, you know, the police, the regulators, uh, like Health Canada, um, you know, provincial governments that select medications to be publicly funded, uh, they just weren't going to appear um, in the way that the police and the prosecutors uh, appeared on law and order. Um, one of the other aspects of the intervention um, that was somewhat novel was our pharmacy model, where the there was a remote pharmacist who had access to the electronic health record. And this also was actually um, supported both by patients and the providers who enjoyed having a pharmacist with that access to this list uh, make suggestions about changes. And actually, it was very controversial before we did the study. The Research Ethics Board at the University of Toronto and St. Mike's Hospital, they asked us to speak to patients before doing the study to see what their views would be about allowing a pharmacist to have access to their electronic health records. 
And the response we got from almost every patient was exactly the same. It was, you mean my pharmacist doesn't have access to my electronic health record already? Like why doesn't my pharmacist have access to my electronic health record if they are prescribing medications? They should know about my health history and about other medications I am on. And so this is, I think, another uh, part of the, um, of the intervention that's generated some interest. We estimated what would be the total cost implications across Canada if a medication list like the one we used in the study uh, was publicly funded for everyone. And in order to make these calculations, we assumed that we would see per pill prices uh, similar to prices in other countries like in New Zealand where these medications are publicly funded. In Canada, as I mentioned, uh, we rely on private insurance and on um, uh, public insurance for people on social assistance and people over age 65 in many jurisdictions. Private insurance companies generally take a percentage of each claim, so they actually prefer higher per pill uh, drug prices, and therefore we have higher drug prices um, in Canada than in other countries, including smaller countries like New Zealand and Iceland. And the estimate was around $3 billion overall in price reductions, um, in cost reduction, sorry. Um, and that would involve though, obviously we're moving over to the public books, uh, an extra approximately $1 billion. Uh, but private spending, including out-of-pocket spending uh, and on private insurance would be uh, reduced by around uh, $4 billion. Um, and yet, like several years later, Canada uh, continues to be one of the highest uh, per capita uh, spenders on, uh, on pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, much higher than uh, like a host of countries uh, that have less purchasing power. Um, we once uh, had this dream that we would do a study, show that publicly funding access to these medicines improved health, reduce costs, um, and, uh, and that those medicines would therefore be publicly funded across Canada. In fact, what happened is we got a number of questions from decision makers in Canada, uh, and um, maybe there were some delays for other reasons. Well, one of the questions we got back was um, what medicines are considered essential uh, elsewhere? And so uh, we went to the World Health Organization and asked them like, so which are the medicines that are most commonly available in other countries? Uh, and they said, that's a good question. Um, we should answer it. So together we created uh, this database of uh, national essential medicines list that in some countries determine which medicines are publicly funded for people. In other countries, they're more advisory about which medications should be prescribed and used. But we obtained lists for 137 uh, countries that listed a total of uh, around 2,000 unique medicines. Um, and uh, yeah, I think if we had known how much time and effort this would take, like translating all the lists into English and uh, like using uh, converting all of the non-standard medication names into standard ones, uh, we may not have uh, done it. And basically there's a big team of people uh, who helped to do it. My role was very small, mostly involves like showing up to talks like this and taking credit for it. Uh, even though there's a large uh, number of people who uh, worked really hard to do it. And um, so there's there were lots of good news stories. Like many of the medications you'd expect like insulin are listed by like, almost every country with a national essential medicines list, as, as we would hope uh, and expect. And in some general categories, like, you know, the common treatments for cardiovascular disease, like beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, et cetera, common treatments for diabetes, uh, like metformin and insulin, they're listed uh, by the vast majority um, of, of, um, of countries. Um, some, uh, like, uh, uh, nicotine replacement therapy for uh, tobacco dependence, less commonly uh, listed. It's so what we found through just a uh, like simple overview of all of these lists. Um, we also compared national lists to the World Health Organization's model list. So the WHO first made a model list of essential medicines in 1977, and they've been updating the list every two years 
since then, and they also provide guidance to countries about how they should update their list. So if we take the WHO list as a standard, you can see that um, there actually are some countries that stay very close to the WHO list. They have like fewer than 100 differences. But other countries where uh, you know there'd be more than 500 differences, and in most of those countries, it's that they're, they have additional medications that the WHO um, does not list. And the whole, the the model, the, the essential medicines list concept or idea is that a short list of medicines can meet the priority health needs of the population. We found some examples of countries that were very similar in terms of their health needs. Um, uh, like one example would be. Slovakia and Slovenia, so countries right next to each other, um, similar histories, similar populations, similar healthcare um, uh, systems. Um, and obviously, I know, like, I don't know if there's anyone from Slovakia or Slovenia here, but I, I'm, I'm sure I'm skipping over some important differences between Slovakia and Slovenia. So feel free to, um, to interject here. And I know also like there are these examples because there's so many similarities between Slovakia and Slovenia, like Slovakia will, will win a hockey game and then they play the national anthem for Slovenia and it's a huge um, issue. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, hopefully making that same mistake. But there are uh, like more than 400 differences in the essential medicines list for Slovakia and Slovenia. And it, it, the, my main point in mentioning that is to say that it's, those differences likely don't reflect differences in the needs of the populations of Slovakia and Slovenia. The needs are the same. And actually, even if you look across the whole world, um, the actual number of treatable conditions, Medicaid, uh, conditions that can be treated with a specific medicine that truly vary by region, it's very small, actually. There are not a thousand such conditions. There's not 500. There's likely not even 100 such conditions. So it's not differences in the needs. Like the main conditions, the main uh, killers are the same across the globe, right? The main killers are uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and common infectious diseases. And those treatments for those conditions are needed uh, all over the world. So the differences usually um, are reflecting differences in the processes for selecting medicines and not the health needs. Um, one example in terms of using the standard of the WHO is they've created this um, uh, stratification system for antibiotics. Um, so some antibiotics should be available everywhere. Uh, those are called the access uh, uh, antibiotics, some should be held in reserve to prevent uh, antimicrobial resistance and for some other reasons. Um, and we actually found that there were some countries that disproportionately listed uh, the reserve antibiotics and actually didn't list some of the access antibiotics that should be um, available basically everywhere. Uh, and we are to do some ongoing work providing some feedback to countries uh, on that. We've also done some comparisons uh, between the national lists and <clears throat> sort of ignoring the standard of the WHO's uh, model list. And I think one of the most interesting findings is that the vast majority of medicines, the 2000 medicines that are listed by at least one country, are actually listed by a small number of countries, less than 10% of countries. And so if you accept what I said about most of the health conditions, the important health conditions being common across the globe, this would actually be a, quite a surprising finding. And it means that the selection of these medicines is likely not um, uh, principally in tune to health needs. Unfortunately, we found that um, almost 100 medicines that were withdrawn for good reason in at least one country were in fact prioritized for access by their inclusion in an essential medicines list. And one example of um, those medicines is Cisapride, um, which is what's sold in Canada as Propulsid for various gastrointestinal uh, symptoms. Um, and uh, it was found to cause cardiovascular deaths, sudden uh, deaths. Um, and this is a book by Terence Young, whose daughter Vanessa uh, died after uh, taking 
Sisopride. And he led a campaign about trying to um, ensure that uh, information about adverse uh, effects of medications were shared globally. And uh, you know, in that um, uh, vein, we are also trying to provide feedback to countries about removing uh, medicines that have been withdrawn elsewhere. Phenoterol is an, another example that's interesting, also uh, causes cardiovascular deaths. Um, it is a puffer that's used for the treatment of asthma compared with salbutamol, which would be the, the common uh, medication used here, which is sold under the, the brand name Ventolin. Uh, it has the same uh, effects in terms of pumping up the airway, um, and uh, salbutamol is actually less expensive, um, but phenoterol is actually prioritized for access uh, in some countries, despite its higher price and higher risk of uh, sudden death. Um, and then one of the issues that we have uh, encountered in providing some feedback to countries is that they don't necessarily always appreciate being compared to the WHO standard or to all other countries. So we've now been um, working on some regional projects where we uh, compare countries within a uh, region or use some other characteristic to identify peers of country like their income level or healthcare spending and compare them uh, within uh, that subcategory and then provide them with feedback on how their list differs, like which medicines they list that other countries don't list and which medicines are listed by other countries but not listed um, by them. So there are lots of things that you can do with, um, with this database that's available at essentialmeds.org. And for the students and trainees in the audience, um, I get, you know, using this database uh, is a fairly efficient way to complete uh, research studies. So if you're interested, you can have a look. We actually, um, maybe this is ill-advised, but we recently agreed um, to update our database. And we've identified more lists. So hopefully by the summer, we'll have um, uh, a more recent uh, database of essential medicines lists. In the last part of the talk, um, and I'll be wrapping up soon, I want to talk about um, human rights. Um, so I think like if people in Canada hear about uh, people in another country, in a low income country who don't have access to basic necessities uh, like clean water, um, food or medicines like insulin or vaccines, it's a reason for concern. And there are Canadian based nonprofits that um, and charitable organizations that try to accumulate funds to provide basics that people need, um, uh, people living in other countries. Similarly, when refugees arrive in Canada, there are a number of non-governmental and community agencies that work to support refugees and ensure that they have a winter jacket. Uh, food, furniture for a new apartment, and that their kids have toys. And I think all of that um, is really wonderful. Um, but I mean, if you take human rights seriously, uh, then we, we do need to, I think, um, pay some more attention to what are the obligations of governments in these situations. And specifically, I'm thinking about the obligations of the Canadian government to provide access to life-saving treatments to everyone uh, in Canada. Um, and I mean, this, this image actually, I, I just inserted uh, into the slide deck, it's the 20 year uh, um, marker, I was about to say anniversary, but it doesn't seem right, for the uh, invasion of Iraq. Um, and According to what I know about this photograph uh, and from the Associated Press, uh, nobody knows exactly like who this detainee is or, or what ended up happening to him, but I, it looks to me uh, like he is um, potentially saying goodbye to his child um, before he's taken away. Uh, and we know that some people uh, who were taken away in this manner uh, never returned. 
And I, I guess I decided to include it here, although it's not directly related to medication access, um, just when we're thinking about how human rights uh, can be applied selectively, when my understanding of human of the purpose of thinking about human rights uh, is that they would apply uh, to everyone everywhere. Um, and in Canada, uh, because Canada uh, is a signatory to the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, that access to the um, highest attainable uh, physical and mental health or the right to health uh, is recognized here. And part of that, um, part of recognizing the right to health is recognizing a core obligation to access to essential medicines, including life-saving treatments uh, like uh, insulin. And, uh, you know, there are um, cases where a person has needed emergency access to healthcare services, and there's been a question, and this would be a person who doesn't have a health card, uh, and there are processes in place um, to ensure that those, those individuals get access, including in emergency circumstances. Uh, and there have been cases where that hasn't happened uh, and they've been challenged. Um, it, but I think there's maybe sometimes less attention to what happens when someone exits a hospital and goes home and dies of a heart attack or a stroke because they don't have access to uh, preventive treatment. And I mean, we can talk about uh, a little bit more the difference between uh, how we think about people who are admitted to a hospital and what happens when someone uh, go home, goes home towards the, the end. Um, I think there are lots of things we could say about COVID vaccines, and this would be a good place to have some discussions about them. The one thing I'll say here before we uh, shortly open up for the discussion is that it seems obvious during the COVID pandemic uh, that everyone should have access to COVID vaccines. And I'm not sure how things rolled out uh, in Nova Scotia, but I know in Ontario, a lot of the usual restrictions on access to healthcare were lifted. And uh, you didn't have to actually um, provide a valid health card in order to get a COVID vaccine. Um, uh, refugees, people who arrived in Canada without status, migrant workers, um, you know, the so-called temporary foreign workers um, were all granted access to COVID vaccines. Um, and if the reason that um, people were provided access to vaccines is because that would protect everyone, um, then I think we have to really uh, ask ourselves like where our priorities are. If it's only when uh, there's an infectious disease um, that could impact the health of affluent people or people with a valid health card that we then want to ensure that everyone has access to a medicine, um, then we probably need to rethink our priorities. Um, I, I just, in, in wrapping up, I, in, uh, after providing uh, these talks in the past, um, I've been told you should say a little bit about uh, yourselves. So hopefully you won't find uh, this too uh, boring, even though it's going to be short. Um, but I'll so I grew up in, in Toronto in uh, like what some people would describe as like the bad part of uh, Toronto. I was then very lucky um, to uh, have the opportunity to study at the University of Toronto and then um, in England for a few years, came back, completed my, um, my medical training there. And you know, some of the work that we've done has gotten some uh, like interesting attention that I never would have anticipated, uh, was invited a couple of years ago, I guess now, uh, to testify toward, uh, before um, a uh, subcommittee of the United States Senate related to medication pricing. And they were interested in price differences between Canada and the United States. So got the opportunity to speak to Senator Bernie Sanders for a little while, actually. And I can tell you, he's exactly the way he seems uh, on TV. Uh, so, I mean, if, he, if it's an act, then he's like, he's very good at it. It seems quite, uh, quite 
genuine in his uh, in his views and his demeanor, um, and have uh, been really um, fortunate to be able to to work through this partnership with the World Health Organization and to pre present uh, in Geneva a few times about our comparisons of uh, of national essential medicines lists. And a few of us just before this talk were talking about um, how some of the work we're doing on medication access connects with uh, some other work that I do related to um, racism within medicine um, and trying to highlight some of the achievements of Dr. Alexander Thomas Augusta. And all of this is really to say that I have this uh, extremely privileged position now and that I feel very fortunate um, to have it. And I recognize that it is relatively uncommon. So we did a, a study of who gets, um, involved in, in clinical practice guidelines. Um, and this is in uh, guidelines, national guidelines in the United Kingdom, the United States, and in Canada. And you can see like most of the panel members are white men and very few racialized women uh, are included in these panels. So I feel that I am in a position um, where I should be using uh, my role uh, as best as I can. So recently, you know, we made a series of recommendations about ways to try and promote health equity during the pandemic recovery period, because there was maybe some more interest in promoting health equity uh, during the pandemic. Um, but the, the last thing that I want to think about is, and because one of the recommendations from that was uh, publicly funding medicines um, for everyone, so ensuring that no one goes without uh, essential medicines in Canada. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, back in 2017, um, together with a medical student and a legal scholar, uh, Professor Lemons at the University of Toronto, we wrote an article about um, a mechanism for potentially uh, precipitating a policy change. And right now, there's a difference between um, access to publicly funded medicines when you're admitted to hospital versus not. So. When you're admitted to hospital, you get access to uh, an inpatient pharmacy that's all publicly funded. It's part of the inpatient services that are generally publicly insured with, with just a few exceptions. And so our proposal would be uh, to administratively admit outpatients to the hospital without them ever setting foot in the hospital um, so that they could ac access publicly funded medicines through the inpatient pharmacy, which is publicly funded as part of the hospital's general budget. Uh, and and it, that same mechanism actually, at least on our review, seems to apply across Canada. Um, and the idea would be to first immediately provide access to people who can't afford them, and also to precipitate a change. So either uh, governments would allow us to continue doing this, in which case we could expand the program, and uh, ensure that everyone has access uh, or uh, could precipitate a, um, uh, a government to try and end the program and then explain uh, why they would want to uh, stop people from having access to publicly funded medicines that are life-saving and that their healthcare providers believe uh, that they need. So I leave you with this. Uh, partly uh, like as an example of some of the work we've done at the intersection between health and law, uh, but also maybe if you know someone who might be interested in helping us to do this, because we would ideally uh, like to implement it in multiple places uh, at the same time, I would be um, interested to connect on that point um, and on anything else that you might like to. Um, so I'm really glad that uh, I had the opportunity um, to deliver this lecture and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So we have about uh, 25 minutes or so, 30 minutes for questions. And uh, I'll let you know there are also people online. And so I will be watching the Q&A of Fox uh, online. So folks who are online, if you do have questions, please insert them in the Q&A box and I will keep my eye on that. Uh, but I'd like to first ask if anybody uh, in the room has a question. Glenn, I see you. Hi, I uh, 
So thank you for your talk. It was really, really good. And I'm just interested in uh, provoking. Uh, I had sort of two questions. So one to ask kind of the beginning and then kind of based on your question, one to towards the end. But I was wondering if you find there's um, any sexist disparity in a sense of like um, in regards to like treating all the patients being that way, as opposed to like experienced by women, for example, and um, like for example, menstrual medication is menstrual, but that was considered essential. Whereas, you know, obviously, like um, I, I know, like for insurance happens, like a lot of the time, like my group covers which is a men, <laughs> largely, and um, and then yeah, like I just never get my vial covered as a way of treating them. So I was just wondering if like, that's such a small example of not really essential medication, but does it kind of go up the ladder that way? Yeah, I mean, I think medication access and selection is highly gendered, um, and I think. I'll just I'll talk about a few examples. One is just medication access, which is my main interest, and because it's determined by edu uh, by employment. You know, there are many jobs typically held by women uh, that don't come with private insurance, um, whereas other jobs that are, like typically male dominated, like they're more likely to have private insurance and therefore more likely to be able to access medicines. I think, uh, you know, as, as you were saying, I think drug development can often target uh, men. Uh, and that was probably the case um, with treatments for erectile dysfunction. Yeah, in terms of essential medicines lists, um, it, I think in most cases, the medicines would be available treating most common conditions experienced by women. I, I think there are some different standards, you know, my own view, and I think a lot of people would probably disagree with this, but I think one of the reasons diclectin is so commonly prescribed uh, and was so commonly prescribed based on these uh, like old studies from the 1970s or even like some from the 1950s is because it's only used by women and only for a, like a relatively short period of time when they're pregnant. And I, I don't think if it was a, a medication that was commonly prescribed to men uh, that it, it would have been used based on uh, that scant evidence. I think there's a lower standard applied when a medication is mostly used by women or exclusively used by women. Could I just, I'm so sorry, I'm going to double right up with you here because I had a comment online that it was difficult to hear the questions, oh. enough. So when a question uh, is asked, if you could sort of restate it, that would be great. And I just wanted to also say, so everyone can hear who's online, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box and uh, we will keep our eye on that. I did see uh, Matt Herter and Elaine Gibson. Sorry, so Matt, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so it was great to see all our important people come off next, but my interest lines as well. Um, so I was really struck by the point about health needs being quite common across some of the universities of the world. Um, and in some ways, I love that point because it you know, shows that to the extent there's lots of variations for other reasons that you might have some serious about it, that's driving. Um, but I'm struggling with it at the same time. And that's because, and I, I worry, it's just a little bit of a gentle challenge about the value of conventional medicine. Uh, I'm wondering how you sort of wrestle with this to the extent you think it is a challenge. Um, and that is the ways in which, for structural reasons, social determinants of health reasons, things that I'm really quite uh, attuned to, the risks and benefits of one treatment actually vary quite, you know, quite a bit. So we had this workshop in the fall where we were talking with regulators about whether they should be thinking about equity as part of their job when they're approving products on the market. Mm -hmm. And they were looking at um, a product, one of the people that participating brought up this product and I blame you know, so Janice, if you don't remember what Bill's mentioned, but it was, a, I think, a vaccine or a medicine that had a serious safety issue that was very rare but awful that happened, withdrawn, and she, her point was basically like the people who needed that most because if they didn't get it, in other words, the safety risk which was real, taken off the market because it's on the market in the US and the company's worried about liability and so on. But the risk benefit calculus in you know, uh, uh, an impoverished part of Africa where people are dying from symptoms of diarrhea from rotavirus was quite different, you know. And so this drug was withdrawn and yet 
from at least some people's perspectives and might have still been very useful in that context. Um, and so like how do you how do you deal with the fact that essential medicines less sort of essentialize the problem and don't necessarily think about the local circumstances, even though the health needs are broadly similar? It's the you know clean water and other ways access to healthcare systems uh, to deal with diarrhea that might be they're so varied. Can you can you speak to that tension at all or sure? Is it a uh, yeah, uh, definitely not dismiss it. So yeah, great comment. It was about uh, like the extent to which it's true that uh, that health needs are really common across the world. And the one example Professor Herder um, provided was around our, our rotavirus vaccine, I believe, that uh, was withdrawn by the manufacturer. It sounds like mostly related to concerns around liability in the United States, but then that might have uh, consequences for lower income countries. Um, that maybe no longer are able to access it. And even if there are the same risks, probably the benefit of the medication uh, is greater uh, in settings uh, where road virus is more common um, and the complications are more common. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the concept of the World Health Organization's model list of essential medicines is that the WHO provides a model list, uh, which is not held out as a list that any country should use, but then that model should be uh, adapted to local circumstances. And uh, it actually does not necessarily need to reflect uh, withdrawals um, or, or even uh, approvals in other countries. And I mean, I gave some examples of how that uh, plays out in a bad way, like when a medication that is removed for a legitimate reason uh, continues to be used in other countries. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily see it as a, uh, as, a, as a limitation of the essential medicines list movement, because it's clear that uh, like rotavirus vaccines sh should be available. And in this case, the question is like about which specific product to use likely. And maybe in the case of rotavirus, um, like what schedule should be used and whether it should be given to older children or not. Um, and those are things that uh, like subsequent decisions that should be made after a rotavirus vaccine is included in a national essential medicines list. That's not really on. Uh, thanks so much. I could have listened to you all day long. Um, you have a wonderful style, but also the study is so detailed and interesting. Um, my question is where we stand in terms of um, the Liberals had promised a universal pharmacare program for Canada. Um, my sense is that it's gotten bogged down in part based on uh, private funding um, through um, private insurance uh, and how that would all work in. But I just wonder if you could comment on the present state of the concept in Canada, the universal uh, pharma care program. Great, thank you. Um, so first there was a, I'll just I'll record for everyone that there was a positive comment about my style because that, that has never happened before. And I, I don't, I'm sure it's never gonna happen again. So I just want to, like if anyone's taking notes here, just to make sure that's recorded. Um, but the main question, uh, well, I mean, like less importantly, there was also a question about, um, uh, about like where we stand in pharma care. Um, in Canada right now, and uh, like specifically uh, with the uh, the current government, Liberal government, that has uh, you know announced several times that they're in favor of a uh, pharmacare of including um, medicines in uh, in our publicly funded healthcare system. So there was a parliamentary uh, uh, report um, that released prior to the pandemic that was titled Pharmacare Now. Um, and then subsequent to that, there was a, a National Advisory Council that was put together and led by Dr. Eric Hoskins. And you know both of those uh, reports ended up recommending including medicines in our publicly funded system. But we know that that hasn't actually happened. And I think there are some uh, reasons to be concerned about whether or not that will happen. Uh, one is uh, related to proposed changes at the patent medicines, patent, patented medicines prices review board, where uh, years ago there was an announcement that the price ceilings were going to be 
uh, reduced in order to reduce the maximum prices for patented medicines, consultations, um, and then uh, you know, policy was developed, and then it actually uh, has not come into force. It seems like um, uh, you know, may never happen in the way that it was originally intended. And I think the reason is uh, because of lobbying from the pharmaceutical industry and the private insurance industry. Um, and you know, coming back now to pharmacare, private insurance uh, is publicly subsidized. So there is this view that by uh, publicly subsidizing private insurance that only some people have access to, you'll increase the number of employers who provide it to employees uh, and somehow make things more equitable, even though we know um, that you know, the current system leaves millions of people without insurance. Um, so yeah, I think the bottom line is like officially the government, uh, the federal government has made public statements that are positive about pharmacare, but then I think they get uh, like lobbied hard by the private insurance industry and by the pharmaceutical industry. And I don't think it's a secret also uh, that there is a revolving door between um, you know, political parties and these industries like the, the private insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry. So although at least 80%, maybe 90% of people in Canada support pharmacare, including medicines in our publicly funded system, and there are all these reports saying it'll save billions of dollars. Uh, it uh, it isn't happening right now. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation. As a, as a former member of the Parkdale community in Toronto, oh. I really appreciate how you're able to bring a lot of intersections together in the research and the data and the and like collaborations. So my question is like a little bit less academic than everyone else's. Um, Essentially, like in efforts to kind of galvanize on this global policy window that was created by COVID 19, that you touched on, I think it's really important for us to kind of bring this discourse on essential medicines to support non infectious medical concerns such as MTBs and COVID. And I was wondering how, what implementation and like partnerships at the community based level looks like for you globally in translating this research and implementing it to equip community based organizations and civil society advocates at the WHO level and regionally with this data so they can kind of like push forward regional task forces around essential medicine that I think currently rely on like the 2016 Medsec Commission and I think are a bit outdated in the data they rely on. Great. So the commenting question was about uh, non-communicable diseases and how to ensure that um, uh, like changes made at the level of the uh, the WHO, let's say, get implemented properly throughout the, the world. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's yeah, it's a, it's a really great point that connects with a number of things. And I think um, you know, like essential medicines list and promoting access to essential medicines is one part of um, ensuring that people actually get access to appropriate care. You know, for some of the main uh, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, we're thinking about like. Uh, treatments for high blood pressure or hypertension. Those also obviously depend on people being diagnosed with hypertension, having their blood pressure appropriately measured, and then having some sort of um, like convenient and reasonable supply of the medicines and someone to, to prescribe them. And I mean, the, you know, in terms of the implementation, there are some countries we've identified where they actually hold back treatments for cardiovascular disease, like even treatments for primary hypertension as tertiary level medicines. So these would be available in practice only in big hospitals. So then in practice only in a large city. Uh, so the idea then would be that people would have to travel from a small town or village to a big city in order to be diagnosed with hypertension and then at a, on a regular basis to have their blood pressure checked and uh, then to get access to the treatments. So you could, and I think maybe this is to your point about implementation, you could fairly easily say at the level of the national essential medicines list that yes, they check the box, they, they provide treatments for hypertension, but actually most people in that country would not be receiving appropriate um, treatment. So, there's a part that you could change in the national essential medicines list, like downloading it to like the primary care sites. Um, and hopefully that would 
come with like the additional resources needed to ensure that people really do have a primary care provider um, and that this is an expected part of primary care. I have a question. And again, I'm going to encourage people online to come up with questions too, because I know there's some very informed people online, actually, in the in our virtual room. But um, my question relates to the politics of formularies, I guess, and it's something outside my area of study, and that I just am very curious about and feel I don't know enough about. So I appreciate what I understand to be your response so far to some of the questions, which is I think that the kind of cope model uh, list would be a uh, potentially a fairly high level so people can make choices, you know, uh, drop down box choices as to what specifically uh, the medications would be, pharmaceuticals would be that would be on a specific list. But then to go back to my question about the politics of formulary making, what I'm thinking about are very sort of localized examples of distinctions in formularies, um, and some of which I'm aware of and some of which I hear tell of, but I haven't actually seen the formulary that gets referred to. Um, so first I would think kind of province by province, we can talk about Canada, even as you know, one country unit that we might look at to have some consistency in terms of essential publicly funded, ideally medicine, but then province by province, there are differences, right? As to how the different provinces go. And so this is my first question sort of goes to federalism and this matter you know, sometimes we talk about provinces as laboratories for, you know, policy experimentation and going different directions. But in this case, it seems even more, you know, concrete uh, choices around pharma coverage. And then within a given province, my own experience being here in Nova Scotia, you'll get sites like, you know, the hospital site, certain choices made there as to like hospital covered things. Then you've got the pharma care program. So folks who are on social assistance and are accessing some medications, but there's choices, there's restrictions, there's, right, there may be differences as between one and the other. And the last example, uh, to my mind, is uh, prisons and, uh, and provincial uh, jails, where as people move in between community, where, for instance, they're on social assistance, so they do have a list of, you know, apparently publicly funded medicines, they're different in the jail, and uh, I have not actually seen the formulary. It's a recent report that we did asked for uh, like transparency as to what the formulary is. But what we do know is that the type of medication, the you know, form of administration, all kinds of things shift as between in the community and there. And so I know that there are committees, but it's not even clear to me who are on the committees uh, and what kind of criteria they use when they make these choices. So uh, I guess that comes back to your project, which is. I think it's just amazing, wonderful uh, work and pushing toward a sort of normative outcome, but it's back to this. Well, it's simple in theory, but then in practice, in part, it's the politics of it that I'm, I'm curious about. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so the, the comment and question was about the politics of um, formularies and other lists of medicines and, and some of the complications caused when lists vary between, like there's a federal, it can be federalist, provincialist, institutionalist at hospitals or um, there's an important mention made of um, correctional facilities. Um, so there, there's actually, a, for federal uh, facilities, there is actually a, a formulary um, that I was actually looking at recently, but I think the, the most recently posted one is I think from 2017 or 2018. Um, maybe there's a more recent version that you're looking for, looking at, which I'd be interested I was thinking in. of provincial when okay. I mentioned not being able to access one yet. Oh, I see, okay. Um, uh, yeah, so, and I'll say, you know, one of the challenges with our database is sometimes when we're contacting countries and asking for their national list, they'll say, uh, we have a national list, or we don't have a national list, but in addition, we have, uh, we have these provincial or territorial lists, and we have these institutional lists, and like, from the perspective of trying to create a data, an international database, we say, whoa, 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 like, you know, we can't, we can't input, like, 30 lists for one country, um, but I think, one of the benefits of the National Essential Medicines list is that you can avoid some of that mess. And I think, like, I know this is not going to be a popular thing to say, but healthcare providers like their autonomy. And I know, like, even in my setting, uh, you know, like I work at a downtown hospital, and then people who work at hospitals that are not in downtown Toronto say, you know, medicine is totally different here. 
you know, like you guys from downtown Toronto shouldn't be telling us which medicines we should be prescribing here because you don't understand the way things work in this community. And then, you know, I have actually had these conversations where I say like, okay, but like which medicines do you use to treat diabetes here? Like, I actually, like this is a neighborhood I grew up in, like diabetes is not different here and you don't actually have a different medicine here. Um, so there aren't, I would say, and again, this will not be popular to say in Canada, but there really are no differences across Canada in terms of which medicines are needed between provinces. Uh, there aren't. The, the, I mean, the only real exception to that would be for conditions where you really need quaternary care, like you need a specialist center, then maybe. And you, in some cases, you do have to travel between provinces to access them. But even in those cases, people living in each province still need access to those medicines, even if they need to access a prescriber in one province. So there really are no differences. The way it could work here in Canada is similar to the way it works in other places. There'd be a single national essential medicines list and the federal government would say to the provinces, if you publicly fund uh, at least this list of medicines, you'll get access to these federal funds that will cover 50 or 60% of the medication cost. Uh, and that's what we deem as medically necessary in the same way that you know we're gonna publicly fund medically necessary healthcare services. These are the medically necessary medicines. Um, and you could say to provinces, if you want to publicly fund other medications or provide other medications, go for it. And you know, then the, the, the provinces would say the same thing for the hospitals. Say these are the medicines we're going to publicly fund. If you want to provide other medicines, take it out of your budget. Um, that's up to you. Um, so in that model, you can allow for people to have their autonomy if they really believe that diabetes is treated differently in this part of Toronto versus that part of Toronto. Uh, then fine. They can uh, they can do that, but it's not necessarily going to be uh, tied to a funding decision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one one thing I kind of thought at the beginning that kind of like moved quickly, but it sort of blocked and brings the subject up, um, was the was sort of like a in um, some sort of graph that had uh, the uh, sort of the results of the the strength, the more you didn't expect the results, and one being that people were able to like. Um, financially stable, stabilize themselves uh, better and like be less in debt when they had access to their medicine. I, I, I can personally see that like when I'm on a medication regime that I can afford and that it's straightforward and that I can follow properly and I have adequate doctors, like I think my stress is obviously reduced and I have less stress. So that means I have less problems in general, like to deal with the rest of my life. And I, I think that that sort of social understanding of the healthcare model that we currently have is, is really, really important. And I think these findings are extremely important. And I wish they were everywhere because I, I think there is like a really big misunderstanding as to like how narrow healthcare and pharma care seem to be taken by the, the overall community, even when speaking to people like within the law school. And if, you know, like they have an idea of if you first you know, you have you have a chronic health condition, you get a medication, you solve the condition, that's how it works. But it's so much bigger than that. And I think like this really speaks to that. So I, I first wanted to thank you. I guess like a question I had is how exactly was this? Like was it like a like a like a policy survey or like how how did this come up with how did these results happen? I guess um like how did you discover that? Yeah, um, yeah, so great um, comments and questions about some of the like non-medical uh, implications of, of improving medication access and about how we um, did our qualitative work. Uh, so in a nutshell, it's both um, survey results. So we had some like standard surveys that we uh, sent questions that we asked people and then we recorded their comments. Uh, and then we also additionally did qualitative uh, we did interviews with, with individual patients and some focus groups with clinicians to try and understand the experiences of people. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, there were the, the short films that we made. Um, and then we used this concept mapping um, technique, which is a technique for analyzing um, qualitative data, where basically you, you code uh, different experiences, and then you actually usually meet together as a group. And this we did with our community guidance panel, and you try and group um, these different experiences in different ways. And then eventually you, you 
uh, can come up with uh, this sort of quantitative map of how closely things cluster together and, and draw a diagram like this. Well, if there is not a last burning question, hold on. It is time to sadly um, bring to a conclusion today's seminar and the seminar series for this year. So before uh, I take the opportunity to thank Dr. Persaud for this uh, wonderful presentation that you've given us, so much to think about. I just want to thank a couple of other people, starting with Dr. Matt Herder, the director of the Health Law Institute. So uh, thanks for another year of uh, leadership and, and guidance and community building. I also want to thank uh, Ashley Johnson, who is our uh, administrative assistant and does so much behind the scene work to uh, make these seminars possible. I wanna thank everybody who has come out to the seminar series, certainly in person as we build back uh, from COVID, as well as online. It's wonderful to have the participants come from all around the world uh, to uh, view the seminar and, uh, and participate uh, with us in thinking more about health law and policy. Again, the series this year, it's called Health and Social Justice, Making the Connections, and those are connections that we'll continue to make, uh, I think all of us from our different disciplines and different locations in and outside the university. We really hope as a seminar series to be open to a variety of perspectives, social locations, um, and to build you know, community and collaboration and rich discussions about, uh, about the challenges that we face uh, when it comes to you know, achieving equitable access to health. Uh, social determinants of the health, um, obviously at the fore in many of these seminars that we, uh, you know, convened this year, but medications, uh, pharmaceuticals being an absolutely essential, as you say, piece uh, of that. Uh, and I was so glad that you could uh, conclude the seminar by reminding us of the deep inequities in access to pharmaceuticals um, and essential medications, the way that you have described. So um, folks, please come back next year when we reconvene our seminar series in September. Uh, but for now, please join me again in uh, warmly um, thanking Dr. Persaud for his work.